Gracious Lord, as we come to think and to look at your word now, we pray that as your people who long to live for you and for your glory, that you would help us not to be just hearers of your word, but doers of it as well. And we pray this now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay. Well, the Bible says many things uh, that people in our community don't like. Uh, that's probably no surprise to you, is it? As we're uh, at the time where we're having debates in public about same-sex marriage, about abortions, about end-of-life issues, euthanasia, all that sort of things. But my suspicion is the Bible also says things that some of us struggle with as well. Well, today we come to a section in 1 Peter that gets us thinking about living well as foreigners, as strangers in the world. And we're going to look at one of those topics that people struggle with. And I need to alert you beforehand because I'm going to use a word that may make some of you feel uncomfortable. Uh, it's actually a dirty word for some, but I'm going to use the S word. And it's submission. Peter's already used it today. But we're going to look specifically at submission and three areas of living as Christians where you are likely to be mistreated for being a Christian, three sets of relationships where submission, though, is called for. And you can clearly see them in that Bible reading that we had there before. If you have a look at chapter 2, verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. And verse 18, slaves, Submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. And over at chapter 3, verse 1, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. Now, before any of you switch off and say, Nah, I'm just not going there. I like Jesus a bit, but that is one step too far. It's primitive. Come on. It's unsophisticated. It's degrading. Surely it's wrong today. Things have changed in 2,000 years. Culture has changed. Well, before you do that, I want you to remember the context of this whole letter. And Peter read out those words, if you're looking at chapter 2, verse 11 there, that is the reminder for all of us that you are foreigners and exiles. Peter is writing to God's people knowing that even back then, the way Christians are to think and to live will always be at odds with the culture that we find ourselves living in. This whole letter is addressing us as people who have a home elsewhere. And so we will have different values and different priorities with a different way of thinking and doing things. And if these words that we're going to go through and look at seem and feel countercultural, it's precisely because they are. You are foreigners and strangers, your exiles, Peter has been saying. And so Peter in chapter 2 verse 12 says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What do those good lives look like? Well, the amazing thing is Peter goes on to talk about submission three times. But before we dig into the passage and look at those, I just want to take a minute to think about that S word. People think it's a dirty word because when they hear it, they tend to think of repression or inferiority or some other negative connotation. But the word simply means to order yourself under someone, just to 
place yourself under them for a reason. And as we can see from the passage that's been read to us, verse 16, submission is to be freely given. It's a submission over which we have control rather than something that is forced upon us. And in the end, it's a submission that we willingly undertake in order to commend Jesus to those who are watching around us in the world. And it is the proper expression of Jesus' lordship in our lives. So, fellow believers, with your Bibles open, let's dive into the first section where Peter says, submit to all human authority, regardless of what government or state you find yourself in, Paul is saying submit to them. Order your lives under their authority. Now what I find interesting, I don't know if you see it a bit on the news or something, but whenever a terrorist is actually caught these days, and particularly if they're an ISIS follower or someone like that, and they're taken before a court of law in whatever country, much like the Bali bomber was, they make comments about refusing to recognise the authority of the court they stand before because they go on to say that it is made up of infidels who have no right to judge the servants of Allah. You see, that's a worldview that says God's people are not ruled by governments and rulers of the state. But the Apostle Peter says here, that is not so with us. We are to submit to the human rulers. And did you notice why we are to do it? Did you notice verse 13 and verse 15? We do it for the Lord's sake. We do it because it is God's will for us. And by doing it, by submitting and living under the laws of the land, we silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, those to whom Peter first wrote this letter as people uh, were people who lived at a time where citizens were to call the emperor Lord. And so as Christians refrained from doing that, they found themselves being accused of undermining the Roman Empire. So that when Christians would no longer go to temples and be a part of imperial religion, many people wanted to blame them for tearing apart Roman society. And so Peter calls Christians to be the best of citizens, dealing with the suspicions and dealing with the unjust suffering by submitting to authorities, willingly placing ourselves under their authority by honouring those that the one true God has put into power. By living such good lives with such good reputations for doing good for society, the people won't be able to criticise or say a word against us. Silenced. Is it any wonder when Christians and the church don't live good lives and we find the church amongst a royal commission into child abuse and when we hear about domestic violence occurring within Christian homes, that when Christians go to speak up publicly today on issues like same-sex marriage, that we are spoken against and criticised. You see, we should live obedient lives. We should pay our taxes and not dodge them. We should obey all the laws of this land even the ones that we think are silly or inconvenient or the one that makes me late for church. And we don't just obey to 
Did you notice what it said there? We are to honour our authorities as well. Honour them. There's a very countercultural way to stand out in Australia, isn't it? But honestly, how are you going with that? Because it is a clear command. Have a look at verse 17 there of chapter 2. Peter writes, show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honour the king. Submit and honour our authorities. Now, you might think with the rulers we have in this land that that's a pretty hard task to do. But remember who were the rulers in Peter's day. The Roman Empire was ruling. And the emperor, probably at the time that Peter wrote this, was Nero. Sure, we obey the authorities, but we are not in awe of them. We are in awe of God. However, anything less than submission and honour and obedience to civil authorities is rebelling against God. But it's not just governing authorities we are called to order ourselves under. We are called to submit to non-Christians in the workplace, even if they persecute us for following Jesus. And for an example of how to relate with those over authority with us, Peter chooses in verse 18 there a household slave and says, even slaves submit to your masters. Now, I know none of you are slaves, okay? I know that. Even though you may not think your boss gets that at times. But slaves at the time were actually the largest group of people who underpinned the economic world in Roman times. And many lived well and comfortably and chose, actually chose to live that way. Paul is speaking to people in the workplace and he says, even at work, Christians are to again have the attitude of submission. And even if you find yourself in a tough job with the least amount of rights, that is to be your attitude. And we do so because even at work, Christians are mindful of serving God and especially if we suffer there. Have a look at verse 18. Peter writes, Slaves, submit yourselves to your master with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. I wonder how you go. It mightn't just be work. It might be some committee you're on around in the community. But I wonder how you bear up when your boss or someone over you unloads an unjust tirade on you just because she can't stand Christians? Or how do you react when your boss takes the kudos that your work deserved because they think believing in God is ridiculous and you can be trodden over? Or how do you react when you find yourself always getting the worst jobs that no one else wants to do. How do you react? Do you react culturally or counterculturally? Do you fire up and show defiance or retaliate? Or do you freely choose to order your life under your boss and live good lives? 
which one of those do you think is a statement for someone living for God and relying on him? Now, I think Peter knows none of us are going to find this easy nor a natural thing to do. And so what possible motivation could he give that would kind that would constantly drive us to such willing submission? Well, have a look from verse 21. He writes, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. As Jesus suffered for us, We are to follow his example. We are to follow in his footsteps. All that bit that Peter read to us from Mark 8 before, when Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And see that phrase there in verse 21 of leaving you an example? It's that idea of tracing of tracing Jesus' footsteps. Now, I'm not sure if they use tracing paper at school anymore these days, but I was brought up in an era when it was all around the classroom. I remember learning my alphabet and how to trace and draw the letters by using tracing paper. I could see through it and go over it to learn it. And the other thing I remember doing was using it to draw an outline of a picture that I couldn't otherwise possibly draw myself. Well, Peter says here, we are to trace over Jesus when we submit, especially in the light of injustice and suffering. We are to copy or trace over him in our experience. That means when we suffer, verse 22, there is no excuse for sin. And verse 23, we are to control our actions and our tongues. Have a look at what he says in 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself Uh, Trust himself to him who judges justly. This is our pattern. This is the example for us. If we're innocent and we suffer insult, we don't retaliate. We confidently trust in God that in the end he will judge justly. That is our pattern. The very pattern that saw the death of the innocent for the guilty, for our salvation. Have a look from verse 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherds and overseer of your souls. That's our pattern. You see, unjust suffering isn't evidence that God abandoned Jesus. And it's not evidence that God abandons you. It is exactly how God has brought about his purposes. Without it, we could not be saved. And it is at the core of Christian living. Without it, I would not know how to live the Christian life. If you are going to witness at work, expect unjust suffering. But how are you going to respond when someone speaks ill of you? or gets nasty or hurtful? How do you respond to the workplace gossip 
or when you're passed over for a promotion or promises that your boss has made to you aren't being fulfilled. How do you just respond when you're mocked as a Christian? We are to repeat the grace of Jesus. That is the pattern. That is our example. Those are the footsteps we are to follow in. We do not retaliate. We do not grumble or complain. And we certainly do not hold a grudge. We are to respond with grace. Treat people with the respect they do not show you. Treat them with the kindness that they do not show you. And pray for them when you'd much rather be praying at them. Follow the example Jesus has left us. But Peter doesn't stop there. He goes on to give a third application of what it might mean to live such good life among non-believers to glorify God. And he uses wives. And here he is talking to Christian wives with non-Christian husbands. And he is saying, even when a Christian woman is married to a non-Christian, part of living for Jesus is submitting to your husband and pursuing a godly character. Look at what he writes in beginning of chapter 3. He says, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. You see, back in first century Rome when Peter wrote this, becoming for a wife to become a Christian would have put her in a difficult predicament. When she married, she was expected to worship the gods of her husband. So if she became a Christian, she could no longer do that. And you can imagine the tension in the household. Furthered when she probably wanted to catch up with other Christian believers. Well, Peter says, you submit to him. Even as you refuse to, bow to, refuse to bow to his gods, you submit and show him the respect as the head of the household. And as you relate to him, the qualities of your character should impress upon him the greatness of your God. And as you work hard at respecting your husband, as you work at adorning yourself with godly character, Peter holds out the hope that your efforts might win your husband over to your Saviour. If you're in that situation, I wonder, do you trust God enough to take him at his word when he says that? I suspect that's going to be hard. You might think, but my husband does not have my best interests at heart. Well, have a look at the example that Peter uses here. He uses the example of Sarah. That woman who submitted to Abraham, even at times when they were went to different countries and Abraham, thinking of himself, says, just tell them we're brother and sister. It'll go well for me. Don't ever mind that it didn't go well for Sarah being taken off into places where she was put at risk. She's probably thinking, that is really dumb, Abraham. And he just didn't do it the once. But she submitted. How could she submit with such a dumb idea? Well, she trusted God. The question is, do we trust God with that when we go to submit? And for you husbands, just quickly, don't miss verse 7 that's tacked on there that says, 
does it say? Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Peter is saying to those of us who are Christian husbands, I think, respect the physical limitations of your wives. Because I think as a general rule, and this is not a universal constant, but as a general rule, we know that men tend to be physically stronger than women. And so Peter just says, don't abuse that offence. He says, try and don't try and control your wives by sheer physical brute strength. Rather, we are to respect our wives. If they're Christians, they are heirs with us of the gracious gift of life, he says. That is, they are chosen daughters of the great King of Heaven. I think last weekend in here I jokingly, well, half-jokingly, uh, said to someone, I am toy toying with the idea of getting my shooter's licence so I can get a great big gun and deal with any bloke who does not deal with any of my four daughters in the future with anything but total respect. Imagine how the King of Heaven feels if we treat the daughter he has given us blokes with anything but total respect. He's basically saying there, treat your, the wife I've given you with total respect or it will hinder your relationship. I'll even stop listening to your prayers. Now, there's a whole lot more we could talk about from these verses, but we won't today. What I do want to do, though, as I finish up, is leave you with a few questions to think about with how we are ordering our lives. Because I wonder, is there some way that I am not properly submitting to those God who in his great wisdom has placed over me? Is there? And, and what am I going to do about it? Who do I need to treat with more respect, even though they absolutely don't deserve it? Who is that person and how am I going to do it? Do I really trust that God's goodness shown in the purity and reverence of my life? Do I really trust that that may help someone into relationship with God? Well, I think the challenge is are we willing to order ourselves under those the Lord puts over us? Are we willing to show grace? Are we willing to walk in the footsteps of Jesus in order to glorify God and see people saved? Let me pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to think about the way we live. Help us to be mindful that we are aliens and strangers in this world and that as we live, we might live for your glory. Help us to see and not be focused on the things of or too attached to the things of this world, but help us to see we are playing on a playing field that involves people's souls. We're playing on a playing field for your glory that we might keep in mind the playing field we're playing on stretches for all eternity. Help us and strengthen us to live and follow and serve you. And we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.